Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran trying to impress your niece with a faded backstage pass to AHA's 1989 tour, or else a scrappy upstart, trying to impress your girlfriend with a limited edition cassette tape you just got from your favorite noise band. This is your show, because ultimately it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the second Friday of February 2023, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Dano who drove a Hummer H2 that got about six miles per gallon and which would play the melody from the song Riding Dirty when you honked the horn. And old Dano would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now. You guys, that's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, uh, and this year, Banzoogle would like to congratulate its members on surpassing $100 $100 million in commission-free sales through their websites. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, you can check out my tour page, joepugmusic.com slash tour, where there are a bevy of new tour dates posted all around the world, from Denver to Seattle to Annapolis, Maryland. Or you can find me the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes live. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a little community over there, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. That's the first Sunday night of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. Head on over to joepugmusic.com and click on the live stream tab to set a reminder. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T. R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you. To everybody who's taken the time and the capital to support the show in that way, if you're not in a position to support the show in that way, I totally understand. You could still help us out in a couple of ways that are entirely free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. This interview was recorded live at the Park City Song Summit, so you might hear a little bit of audience uh, noise in the background, but uh, it was a treat to get to talk with my friends from Bonnie Light Horseman. Our 
guests this week are the members of the folk music supergroup Bonnie Light Horseman. The group is composed of Anais Mitchell, a Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter and the creator of the hit Broadway musical Hadestown, Eric D. Johnson, the creative force behind Fruit Bats, and Josh Cow <clears throat> and Josh Kaufman a celebrated musician and producer who has worked with Taylor Swift, The National, Josh Ritter, Bob Weir, and many others. In 2021, their debut album as a group was nominated for Grammy Awards for Best Folk Album and Best American Roots Performance. The Guardian called their debut an unalloyed pleasure. American songwriter says that their latest album is played and sung with honesty and a sure sense of the mutual lyrical, compositional, and vocal abilities of its three talented musicians. I got a chance at the Park City Song Summit to talk with all of them about their musical journey so far. Bonnie Light Horseman, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. There's a ton of background to get to uh, as we begin, because all of you are so musically accomplished before this project began. Anais, obviously known for her own records and for her Tony Award-winning folk opera, Hadestown. Eric D. Johnson from the Fruit Bats. Josh Kaufman from producing and playing on records with Craig Finn, Josh Ritter, even Taylor Swift, all over the place. I suppose... My question to begin is, don't have time to get into all your backstories because we've got a little bit of time. How did you guys, what's the backstory of you three? What was the genesis of this project and how did you meet each other in the first place? Um, I really like Anais' answer for this. Can I like, do you, because you, you yeah, do yeah. like a really good like. She does it, she says I can it do so it fast. Speed, she says like, it like really an auctioneer. Like, at I can a do game. a rapid auction. fire one, yeah. Like, um, yeah. yeah, okay, like so. Like a machine situation. Here I go, ready? Yeah. Josh and I were both living in Brooklyn okay. uh, a few years ago. This is pre-pandemic. And I had sort of admired Josh. Josh is playing with Josh Ritter and, and other people and records that you had produced. And um, we were put together to make a track with our mutual friend Kate from This Is The Kit. If you know this band, incredible band, uh, songwriter. And um, we did that. And then we had so much fun and we thought... We sort of discovered we were both interested in traditional music, especially like across the pond, British Isles type of stuff. And we began to mess around with some of those songs. Um, and then Eric, so I had, um, Eric and Josh go way, way back. They're like old buds. And um, I had just discovered Eric's music as Fruit Bats. And I was, I can remember that I was getting on stage in um, Colorado and the house music was playing um, Humbug Mountain Song. And I, I didn't know what it was and I, I couldn't even get on the stage. I was like, I had to find someone to tell me. I didn't have Shazam. <laughs> I was like, what, what is this music? And someone said, Fruit Bats. And so then I kind of reached out to Eric on the internet and said, oh. I love fruit bats, and you were like, "Hey, thanks." And uh, and then Josh was passing through LA uh, on tour with maybe with Ritter or oh, someone. Josh, yeah, other Josh. And um, and was like going to have dinner with Eric and said, "Hey, I have a feeling like Eric could be really great for this folk music project that we're doing." And um, sh should I ask him if he wants to be in our band, which mm -hmm. wasn't even a band at the time? And I yeah. said. Hell yes, because I was so into Fruit Bats, and Eric said yes. He came to New York, we started messing around with some songs, and this was all kind of bound up in this time where um, Justin Vernon and Aaron and Bryce Desner were organizing these artist residencies, um, booking a festival in uh, Wisconsin, and also as this like artist residency called People in Berlin. And our kind of first record, and really like our whole band was kind of forged in the fires of that because um, those guys offered us to play at their festival and then come and do the residency. And we didn't even have a band name at the time. And we didn't have a, didn't have a set. A set, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> We had like unfinished songs. Wow, sorry to interrupt. That, no, that was great. And, but we said, yes, we will do it. And we will make a band name and a set. And we did. <laughs> and then we made a record. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, because in the music and in the arts, maybe just in life in general, there's a lot of ideas floating around, right? And you have a lot of good ideas. And 
you know, there's a very low batting average, though, of ideas that come to fruition, right, that actually manifest in the world. I'm sure you guys are brimming with ideas yourself, all, all three of you. Why was it this, how did this project manifest while other ones didn't? Like, what was the quality of this project that made it actually come into the world? I mean, everything in the music business is a low batting average, as you know, so <laughs> you, you have to sort of just yeah, accept that Fair and enough. be like, if I'm batting 250, I'm the Mendoza line, as they say. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know why this one worked out. At least I think it worked out. Um, I don't know. We have complementary skill sets. I think. What are those? The, the sort of cliched, uh, we create like a Voltron monster with each other. <laughs> that's, um, and uh, um, so we have complementary skill sets, but also are, have sort of uh, gentle and deferent personalities as well. So um, that combination makes a good Voltron robot. Can you remember a specific moment, any of you, when you kind of realized uh, that you had complementary skill sets and that the, it, the sum was more than the parts? Maybe felt, some, summer dream. Oh, and the, oh, that that late. Wow. I, I, actually, well, I, I mean, we knew it before. <laughs> I just mean wow, that was Rick. okay. <laughs> Maybe not was, so. I just mean it yeah. was. Um, it was. It it, it it had a. It was very clear with that uh -huh. one. Yeah. I knew it before. I just mean uh, it was made. It was visualized. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I felt like the the honestly the the first time I heard the two of you guys sing together. I was like, oh, this feels like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like kind of all the lines, it all kind of lines up and locks, you know? And, and then I think I just spent so many years backing people up that I knew what to put underneath it. And so it kind of just naturally fit together. But I think honestly hearing them sing unison, I don't know. So you can sing in harmony, you sing two different notes together, you sing in unison, you sing the same note. And when they sing the same note together, it kind of, they have very different, Sorry, I'm talking about you guys like you're like, <laughs> they, these guys. Um, they, it's like, um, it is like a, I don't know, just like it, 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 the singularity of each of your tones comes together and makes a new sound on the same note. It's just like, a, I don't know, it's just a lot of personality and a lot of emotion in it. And it's, it's, I felt that way too, like the first yeah. time we sang together. And actually I remember it was, it, at Eau Claire, Wisconsin, like in a hotel, and it was that Ann Briggs song, Go Your Way, Go your that way. we used to cover, and we don't really do it anymore, but there was something where I was like, whoa, and because I don't really think of myself as a harmony singer, and I think both of us are, are lead singers and have a sort of laser beam style thing where sometimes, like I think a really brilliant harmony singer will sort of disappear into the sound, yes. but we neither of us really do that. We're just kind of like, full on at the same time and it felt powerful and, and, and it didn't, I didn't know it was gonna be like that. And then also I would say like our first record was a weirdly charmed, like we were just, we were in Berlin at this artist residency, we were, we were um, in this weird, well, it was like a bureaucratic building from yeah. East German, like... <laughs> Old radio station. Very romantic, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it was. It was at these empty, reverberant, like, halls, and we just kind of set up shop somewhere, and there was friends, like, coming down the hall, and we're like, hey, do you want to play a drum on this? Do you want to come sing this with us? And the songs were all, um, you know, they were their folk music and they, there was a, sort of an, a way in, like they were, the door was open for literally, the literal door was open mm -hmm. and the song's door was also open. And, but we didn't know we were making a record till we kind of got home and listened back and it was like, it felt like a found object that was special. And um, Totally. It, it's it's very special that you had that space and time to create in. I feel like every mid-sized town in America since 1995 has meetings and projects. Like, we're going to have an artist space here, and artists are going to come here, and they're going to just make... And it, like, never works. Mm -hmm. like, we're going to have a coffee shop here so they can play. Never works anytime. But what you're talking about there, this this residency that you were a part of, that seems like the, the dream realized mm -hmm. of, of all these things. It sounds like in some ways maybe this band wouldn't have been realized had it not been for this time and you know literally geographic space that you had to, to work in yeah that's absolutely right I think like it's also so rare at this point in our lives you know there's families and partners and all these things that you're kind of rushing to get home to right so like we were just talking about that earlier you know um 
So to have that space, that creative space, um, that where you can sort of like let go of of the mercenary quality of traveling to work and just yeah. traveling to create became something like I think it's also rare for musicians. You find it with more like painters go and they paint in a cabin somewhere, and writers go to like a monastery or something. It's like it doesn't happen with musicians as much where you're like because you have to do it together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To have that space. You have to do it together, and there's also like a certain technical bar that you have to hit with recording technology. Luckily, over the last 10 years, you know, recording technology has really caught up where you can be somewhere with not that much gear yeah. for pretty low expense, at least compared to what it used to be, yeah. and put together a recording that, that can be published. I know um, both, um, both you, Eric, and you, Josh, have an acumen with recording. Did you put that into use with this, or did you guys have a, an engineer that you were working with? Um, well, we have, uh, we, yes, um, a little bit, but um, uh, mostly from a production standpoint, we had our friend who was in Berlin with us, Bella Blasco, who's like a, kind of like a brilliant engineer and then she sort of like fly on the wall, captures stuff very naturally. There's not like a lot of like hype to the tone, sounds really like um, realistic. And so she, when we were rehearsing these songs, she sort of placed mics around, like spot mics. Um, so it wasn't like isolated or anything. There was like, for instance, like one mic to capture Aeneas and her guitar and a mic, you know, near Eric and I. A mic, there's like six mic front, there's six channels basically. Mm -hmm. So we took that and we took that home and we made the record based off that stuff. Um, does that answer the question? It we, does. Had, we had an engineer. It does. Yeah, yeah. It also sounds very much in this folk music tradition, which you've mentioned. Can you, for our listeners, and also for me, honestly, can you kind of describe what is unique about this sort of British Isle sound of folk music and what makes it unique? Wow. Um, yeah. yeah I, and maybe we all are reluctant because it's sort of like, I don't feel that the music we're making now is defined by that anymore. Oh. But, but at first, it definitely was really inspiring. And for me, I've always, I've always gravitated towards that type of traditional music. And I think it's because um, it's like slightly exotic to me. The, oh, the, the, the wide open, we tuned our guitars, uh, yeah. open D, I had never done that before. Yeah. I had to learn from Josh. Like I was like, what, how do I play the four chord? <laughs> and like show it to me. Yeah. And um, a lot of these songs have like a really open kind of droney thing. And then the melody can go anywhere around that thing. And um, for me also always like inspired by the language of those, the British Isle stuff and the, um, uh, the long, like just a lot of lyrics and long lines. And our music is maybe more spare lyrically and more like impressionistic, more space for breathing and improvisation and uh, yeah. yeah. Eric, where did you fit in? They said that they had a connection of, over that type of music when you were brought into the project. Were you aware of that? That that was kind of like the, the North Star or did you just want to make a band with your friends that you thought were great musicians? No, I was aware and I love that kind of music. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So, um, what yeah, we always kind of say like the easy, the easy like pull quote story of the three of us, like in our relationship with that music is like Aeneas kind of had actual folk music in her house growing up more or less, like, um, the, like, super traditional stuff. Josh and I, I definitely came from, like, listening to Top 40 music, you know, and from, like, a pop background, and Josh and I kind of came by that music, like, through the Grateful Dead and the Birds and stuff like that, but I loved that music, and I've always been kind of, like, a head for 60s psychedelia and stuff, so I, I, I was more, like, um, getting into the incredible string band and then I like went through like an obsessive phase of like Fairport convention but the the less tratty side of the first few records where they're like kind of this almost like British version of Jefferson Airplane or something <laughs> so I, I was coming to it from like sort of a sumptuous psychedelic side of things a little bit and and the yeah just like the vibey song craft of it was really? it allowing you to let out a part of yourself creatively that you weren't able to let out in Fruit Batch, your main project? I mean, I have some songs, like, my song Absolute Loser is, like, just deeply indebted to Fairport and stuff like that, so I'd, I'd like, certainly, like, I'll let influences kind of poke through sometimes, but it was more fun to have a little bit of a focus on it and have a little bit of, like, a 
a pull star for the for at least that first record to be like, oh yeah, it's it's cool to like think about Ham Briggs and Fairport and stuff. Yeah. Well, was there any sense for all three of you creatively? You, I mean, it's, it sounds very star-crossed the way that all this kind of comes together and, and having that space there. Do you feel like uh, you were able to be in that creative space because it was not your main thing? I was just going to actually mention that when you, when you asked Eric, it, it, I, I did think about that for a second. Like, um, I, I, I may be speaking for you guys more than myself, but like, um, uh, I think there is something maybe shedding having to be the face of something, having the pressure on just you to sharing it, right? And we can kind of lean on each other, um, maybe allows for a different type of expression, different emotion um, to, to come out from, from that. Yes. What he said. What do you, what do you guys think? <laughs> we, we do like to joke that this is Aeneas' rock band and my folk band. So, because like for me, it's like, oh, it's so quiet and awesome. And for Aeneas, she's like, oh, this is like rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Oh, fair enough. We get, we get to kind of like scratch a little itch that like maybe with our other, pro- it's, it's some kind of like fun um, meet in the middle of like um, what, um, yeah. And also what Josh said. It's, I, I enjoy stepping into the spotlight and then I also very much enjoy stepping out of it too. Sometimes like, you know, yes. from one song to the other, I, it's like uh, very relaxing on stage yeah. instead of uh, having that sustained spotlight thing, yes. which I, I also love, but it's a, there's a different kind of energy that you have to um, yes. expel, as you know, too, mm-hmm. like where it's just like that 90 minutes of energy that is like all on you. Um, it's yeah, we're we're sharing the load a little bit, the three of us. Yeah, I was just gonna add, like creatively, I, I feel like I have some distance from this now. But at the time that we started making this music, I was really like gunning for this musical that I worked on for like 13 years to get to Broadway, and it was the most stressful thing I've done ever in my life. <laughs> like, talk about. There's some people doing IVs here because we're at a high altitude, but like I like literally needed IV. <laughs> during this stressful time of my life um, when I was working on the show, which was all about text, you know, uh, just the character development and plot development and text. And we started doing this thing and there was something so relaxing about it in this way, like just even the detuning of the guitar to open D, I felt like, ah, (laughs) <laughs> this feels great. And then when I would go to work on Haiti Sound, I had to go back to standard tuning. It was like, it felt that I was putting on a corset or something. You used to call it, I have to put my guitar back in missionary tuning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 for me, like, I, I have had, you know, that, I, I loved working on Haiti Sound. It was like, I was obsessed with it for so long and it um, really took over my life. Um, but I, I definitely, I had a sort of worldview about it create, and creativity where it was like, it, in, in order for it to be good or beautiful, it has to be hard and long. Yes. And that wasn't the case with this project. It was like, wow, this feels good and it feels beautiful and it's actually easy. Like it felt really intuitive for us. And so I kind of was like, wow, it can also be like that and I want more of that. If Hades Town was your corset, was Bonnie at Horseman then your Victorian fainting couch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, it feels like my moo moo that another I like spin quote. in the field. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett? 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter. 
because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. Bonnie Light Horseman's latest album is entitled Rolling Golden Holy, which follows in a long tradition of songwriters attempting to demonstrate and participate in the sacred. There's a poem that I love which examines the sacred from an unexpected angle. It's by June Robertson Beisch, and it's entitled Holy Ghost. The congregation sang off-key. The priest was rambling. The paint was peeling in the sacristy. A wayward pigeon trapped in the church flew wildly around for a while and then flew toward a stained glass window. But it didn't look like reality. The ushers yawned, the dollar bills drifted lazily out of the collection baskets, and a child in the front row began to cry. Suddenly, the pigeon flew down low, swooping over the heads of the faithful like the Holy Ghost descending at Pentecost. Everyone took it to be a sign. Everyone wants so badly to believe. You can survive anything if you know that someone is looking out for you. But the sky outside the stained glass window, doesn't it look like home? I think it takes both things though, to, to lead an artistic life. I mean, and I've told you this before, Naz, but one of the things that I just admire about you the most artistically, and it's a quality that I hope my kids get, not just in artistic sense, but personally, is your ability to chase down that musical for 13 years and shepherd it through, and your steadfastness with that is just so um, admirable and worthy of emulation. And you need that part uh, very much in a creative life. You can't have a creative life without it. But you're also talking about this other part here, which is just this kind of sheer inspiration of, you guys want to make a record in Berlin, and we've never really played together, and then do you want to tour it three months later? I mean, that you need both of those things. How, what have you learned about putting, all three of you, what have you learned about putting those two things in balance? Because I know both of you, Josh, producing records, I'm sure you have, those have a longer time horizon, you have to stay focused and work on them in a certain way. You with Fruit Bats, Eric. How do you guys balance that that need to stay focused as an artist and see th- things through for as long as it has to, to also maintain a place of playfulness and fun and spontaneity. I think you have to like kind of find the time to be open with each other about like kind of how you're feeling about the music and where it can go next and being ex- always kind of like being excited about the next thing that you're going to do and not really looking back on what you've done. That, that helps me at least, kind of, with, with this band. Also, I, just being in a band is fun for me. Right, right, right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it's that aforementioned batting average where I'm, like, in a young person who's, uh, like, I want to do a band. Um, I always want to say, like, okay, um, you don't want to know how terrible your odds are of this, like, working for you. And I don't say it in a negative way, just a realistic... I wouldn't say that to someone because that's not my style. But... Sure. Um, you don't want to know your odds, so just relax and settle into it. Cause like, yeah, it's the, and then you could list every cliche like, don't hold the sand. The sand will go through your finger. Yeah, it's just sort of like I'm always just like, this is like such an impossible task. So just relax and do it. I heard an interview with Will Ferrell of all people once, and his dad was a musician, a professional or semi-professional musician, and he said before he started in comedy, his dad gave him almost that exact same speech. He said, look, I've been in entertainment my whole life. It's a crapshoot. 
man. No matter how good you are, no matter, like, it's kind of a crapshoot on a certain level. So kind of throw caution at the wind, go for it, and it's probably going to flop. So don't worry about it. And he credited that speech. I mean, basically what you're talking about right there with, with kind of giving him the freedom to just say, well, it's probably going to flop anyway. So yeah, and, and it's like you can you kind of look at it. It's probably gonna flop anyway, or the the more half full is just kind of like it's gonna be really hard, and yeah. uh, it just just continue to ring your bell, um, and and then you know maybe a couple people will hear it eventually. But yes, yeah. Well, how does a band that began in such a spontaneous and genuine way, like there's been a wonderful response, audience and, and critical wise to the band. So now the band takes on a life and that life is different than the birth of the band. Obviously there's different things that it takes to carry on a band and iterate a band over time. So how are you guys, you, you have a second record in the bag now? Yes. Yeah. So how do you, how do you take a project that began in a certain way and then continue to iterate it over time? I feel like our experience is actually uh, pretty unique in that we became a band, made a record, toured for like two weeks, and then the world shut down COVID, for two yeah. years. Yeah. And and during that time, we made another record. Like ultimately, we haven't even done that much touring. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't gotten to maybe the point you're describing yet. <laughs> so maybe ask us. Maybe <laughs> ask us. Well, in a few maybe months. not from a touring perspective, but you've gone and made a second record. Yeah, right? and, yeah. and I know I've talked to artists before who have had star cross records where they, everything just kind of came together with the first one. And then there seems to be a strange type of pressure to make when you're making that second one. You're like, well, this one's going to be easy too, right? Right? You know, like, what was your experience going into work together creatively again? Was there that sort of pressure or were you able to uh, look past it and just focus on the canvas? We had this sort of... Uh kind of unspoken sort of yes and approach to when we got together again. So be like, you know, kind of like improv comedy thing, like, like that's a cool idea and then this, you know, and kind of like, so we were passing ideas around pretty naturally and um, it kind of, it, that, that helped carry us through, I think. Again, leaning on each other, it, it didn't feel like the pressure was on any one of us necessarily. Although, if I'm being totally honest, I think there was a, little production stressy moment I had in between the first two sessions of like, we need to make this a little better than it is. <laughs> but then but then we got there. Yeah. I love I love it so much. I'm proud of it. But I don't know. What do you guys think? That's pretty right on the money. I I I don't uh, I just, making records is so fun. That's like the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Um yeah. I never yeah, I we had so much fun. Just kinda laugh the whole time. Are there parts of you um, creatively as an artist that you have to unlearn to work with a project like this or that you have to put on hold for your own projects? That's a great question. I mean, it's, it's certainly a deeply different process than Brute Bat's album making for me, which I, I kind of do in a specific way, but I like it. I like the, it's, it's just super cool. I, I think we all respect each other and are totally open to learning from each other too. And like, uh, we, we, at least I think these two are cool. So I'm like, these, uh, <laughs> I think always my goal in the music business or anything is just like, really, as long as people that I think are cool think I'm cool, that's like the number one goal. I think that's like a lot of people feel that way too. Yeah. So I was just like, I don't know, I, these cool people seem to think I'm cool. So it makes me very relaxed, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been interesting. I mean, I think for us also to figure out, well, what are we doing now that we're not doing, we're not working with Chad music the way we were, and what is what is a Bonnie Light Horseman song, you know? And we're we're all bringing sketches and ideas, and then we sort of identifying which are the ones that we all can get in on because we're we're really all want to be in the sandbox of each song together, and. Um, for me, I would say, because, I, I, yeah, I answered this question in an interview recently, like, what's the difference writing-wise or whatever? Mm -hmm. And for me, definitely, like, writing my own stuff, right, it feels like um, sort of part, like, therapy, part, like, praying in some way. And it's totally different to be in that process with other people where it's like you're collectively exploring something, you know? It's like... Where does where does this want to go, and um, 
and also for me, I, my own stuff does tend to be really uh, wordy. Like, I'm pretty obsessed with words, as you know. And um, so this band is not, this band is more impressionistic. There is more space. It's like, it has to be that way. That's what feels right. And so, like, more than once, I feel like when we made the second record, I was like, hey, how about this idea for verse three? And you guys were like, how about only two verses? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. love that. But I but also that's funny you say that cuz I feel like I learned a lot from you of like a no not not a word left behind, you know, two where it's just kind of like are you sure that's the third line to that second verse and then you're like, "Oh yeah, maybe let's like go back and look at that." So, um but yeah, I am a hyper and I think Josh and I share some minimalistic uh tendencies too with like, yeah, don't bore us get to the chorus. Um <laughs> Yeah. I also like this. I like the kind of like I like this sort of like, um, I like the, what the music can do to the words after they've been sung. Like, where, like what you can do with the music after when a line's kind of just hanging there, you know? Like, like even on Bonnie Light Horseman, there's verses from that song that we don't sing, right? Yeah. So there's like, yeah. like quite a few, I think. Yeah. So, um, but there's, there's a lot of um, kind of drama and emotion in that space between what's unsaid, you know? Yeah. There's something about, th if there's three verses to a thing, it becomes, there's an arc and a narr there's a narrative closure at the end. Whereas if there's two verses, it's like, here's this image, here's this other image. Yeah. You guys do what you yeah, want with that. Here's some, here's some vignettes and, and you yeah. fill it in. You That's know? the Tom Petty, Tom Petty method. I always feel like he'll, he writes an evocative first verse that's yeah. like a little bit open-ended where you're like, I think I know where this is going. Then he just pummels you with an yes. incredible chorus for like a while. Yes. And then you get this kind of second <laughs> verse where you're like, there's, I think there's, I think he's giving me closure, but it doesn't really matter. Like, because yeah. he just told my whole life story yeah. somehow yeah. too. So yeah, that's like always yeah. a touchstone for me. But, you're like yeah. just platitudes in verse two, but in the first verse he said, we smoked cigarettes and stared at the moon. Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about my 14 year old girlfriend. Yeah. And yeah. Just like, yeah. what's, what do you do? Yeah. He's to be clear, magician. the girlfriend that I had when I was 14, not, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that was that was understood. Well, that was understood. Good catch. Joe Pug canceled at Park City. <laughs> <so I'm sorry. laughs> you know, they're talking a lot about um, the lyric here, and we talked earlier about the harmonies and the unison singing that we're doing, and it kind of reminds me of this is something that I wanted to dig into that I didn't get to earlier in the interview, which is Josh. You were talking about when you heard them sing you heard a way that you could jump in and support that musically and melodically in the background. And it, it kind of sounded like it was different than other projects that you had worked on. So how are you coming in? Like, what do you hear when you hear them sing? And, and how are you coming in to support it and change it and, and shade it and make it compelling? Hmm. Wow. That's a really hard question to answer because it's something that I say musically, like I don't, Say it with mean. words, yeah. that makes sense, mm -hmm. which is not, I'm not trying to make a cop out here. Like, well, then let, like, let me ask yeah. you a question that you'll be able to, to better answer it. What techniques do you use then to, to be able to speak musically? Were there other techniques that you had to use to be able to speak in a different way? Uh -huh. than what they do? Yeah, so um, there is like, we, we touched on it briefly in these open tunings that we play in, like um, there's a lot of modal activity and suspensions in the chords, so you get these... Um, you, so, like a suspending chord, you guys ready for some music theory? <laughs> okay. So, you have three notes in a chord, and then you add a, you can like add a fourth note, and it'll almost be like two chords on top of each other. You can get these two different emotions at the same time, you know? And that happens in an open tuning all the time, because you get these droney, Eric and I like to joke, like droney baloney, <laughs> these droney notes in there, almost like a, like a, um, like a dulcimer. Right. you know, where it's tuned modally. So th having that, um, like almost like that limitation, um, what the, you know, you can do a lot with that and I feel like that putting that underneath the, the voices and coloring it really, really helped. Sort of like, like a nerdy, like inside baseball answer, but that's like. Well, the, no, but that drone, and I've heard people who work with traditional music who are working with open tunings, um, more than once I've heard people refer to that drone as sort of uh, 
almost like a, a religious intonation that kind of carries its it, way through. The, it is. It's like it's like a harmonium or, or something you would have, like a meditation. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that you guys remember that band, uh, the Low Anthem. Of course. Matt Davis is here tonight. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things I loved about that band is they would in that first record that they put out, they just had this pump organ, and that would just sit on one note, and it would drone through the whole dang song, and it sounded. It just brought you to tears, you know? Yeah. Uh, Organ music is like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of droning and I guess in gospel music too. Yeah, all that stuff that... Fiddle music, yeah. Fiddle music, there you go. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Yeah. That's... All the stuff that like kind of shoots an arrow right into your heart, you know? Usually there's some kind of bed underneath all that, you know? There is. Cooking away. Um, you guys going to tour this one pretty hard? The one coming out now? I wouldn't say pretty hard, but we're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> medium. Not medium un- hard. Medium hard? <laughs> yeah. Stiff to medium peaks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on. Um, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter Podcast. And uh, Bonnie Light Hortzman, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, thanks Joe. Thanks, Joe. This week's show was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Bonnie Light Horseman's latest album is entitled Rolling Golden Holy, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.